Welcome, and thank you for joining us for Open Tools for Data De-Identification. My name is Christine neiman Hislop, and I am the Data Education Librarian for NNLM Region 1. I'm joined today by Katie Pierce-Farrier, the Data Science Strategist from NNLM Region 3. We're also joined by Rebecca Brown from the NNLM National Training Office, who will be providing links and tech support in the chat. Um, today we are delving into de-identification tools, exploring their importance and how librarians can effectively use and advocate for these technologies. Before we dive into that, I just want to share a brief little background about um, who we are. We're the network of, we are from the network of the National Library of Medicine, also known as NNLM. The NNLM is the education and outreach arm of the National Library of Medicine, which is one of the 27 National Institutes of Health. The NLM is the, lar the world's largest biomedical library, which maintains and makes available a vast print collection and produces electronic information resources such as Medline Plus and PubMed. The NNLM is composed of seven regional offices. You can see them marked on our map here across, around the United States. And each office offers funding for organizations and communities in their regions in addition to a wide range of training and education opportunities, including around data science and research data management. If you'd like to learn more, you can visit nnlm.gov. With that, I'm going to turn off my camera. Um, but we have three learning objectives today. The first is that we will define artificial intelligence and natural language processing. We will compare the NLM scrubber to other clinical de-identification tools. And we will talk about how to implement open de-identification tools into your library instruction and outreach programs. We have a brief, here's a brief agenda. Um, as part of introducing today's main topic, tools for clinical text de-identification, we're going to be, um, we're going, to, we're going to talk briefly about some of the technology that's behind the NLM scrubber and other de-identification tools, mainly natural language processing, or NLP. We want to give this foundation so that you better understand how these tools work and why they have the different strengths and weaknesses that they do. So to start, we'll be talking about different types of artificial intelligence and how they are used to de-identify data as well as the definitions and differences in what is considered personally identifiable information, or PII. We'll then talk about the NLM Scrubber, which is a data de-identification tool that uses NLP to remove sensitive data, and Katie will be sharing a demonstration of the tool. We'll discuss some of the challenges of data de-identification, specifically for the Scrubber and in general, and we'll finish with ideas for how to promote these tools at your institutions. So to start, um, what is AI? What is artificial intelligence? Um, AI really is an umbrella term. It covers a wide range of tools and functions. Um, AI is often described as mimicking human intelligence. If we think uh, humans, you know, can pick out um, can pick out what might be sensitive information. We can differentiate between a date of birth or an address from otherwise random strings of text and numbers. And depending on what you want to accomplish, AI can do a variety of tasks and functions. Uh, we like the definition here from the NNLM data, data glossary, which discusses the, how AI processes, analyzes, and recognizes patterns in large data sets. And they use those patterns to get better at completing tasks or solving problems. Now that we've defined AI, um, we can also talk about how, with, um, how within AI there is machine learning and there's deep learning. Machine learning focuses on using data and algorithms to enable machines to learn and make decisions. It focus, um, this focuses on identifying patterns and predicting future patterns. You can think of an example of machine learning as the suggested movies, suggested songs that come up on Netflix or Spotify. Then there is deep learning. And deep learning is modeled after human brain, is, is more actually modeled after human brain structures to better understand concepts with many different factors. Um, so we can, examples of that we can think about are autonomous vehicles or image recognition. 
Overlapping both of these is natural language processing, or NLP. This type of AI, um, natural language processing, it might be a type of machine learning focused on finding and predicting patterns in a language. Or it could be a type of deep learning, looking at multiple factors and broader context of a language. Natural language processing, NLP, is another subtype of AI, and it is what's behind the NLM scrubber. So we're going to look at it a little more in depth. Since human languages follow grammatical rules and predictable patterns, we can teach those rules and patterns to computers. Um, NLPs can take human language, analyze them using a complex series of algorithms, statistical inferences, and provide an answer that's understandable to humans. So you can see in this graphic here, words in, computer program, words out. <laughs> NLP models and algorithms can be trained to respond to questions, to write essays, to translate text into another language, or even give verbal directions while you're driving. NLP is where computer science and linguistics, which is the study of languages, combine. So NLP allows computers to understand and mimic human language and speech. It can perform complex computations and process large data sets much faster than any human. But of course, there are also some caveats to this. Um, if you've ever worked with computer programs or other systems, these um, computer programs and systems, no matter how well trained or sophisticated, can still make mistakes. Um, they can hallucinate or do any number of unwanted things. Um, humans still need to look over a program's output and verify its accuracy. I'm sure many, if not all of us, have received some strange nonsense answers from a computer program before. So as we, as we said before, natural language processing is a type of AI, and depending on how a model is designed, it can carry out a wide variety of tasks. Human languages have grammar rules, they have discernible patterns, and NLP can use these patterns to predict and produce or pre uh, to predict and understand and, and produce human language. NLPs are often trained for very specific, highly detailed tasks, such as finding names and date of births in a document. These tasks require a very deep and narrow understanding of language. Just as a reference, and we won't be talking about this in depth today, but you've likely heard of large, you may have heard of large language models, or LLMs. LLMs are also a type of natural language processing. Um, they include, uh, the, this is applications such as ChatGPT, Google Bard, Gemini, but LLMs focus more on producing human language. They are also trained, they are trained on massive amounts of text and are meant to produce human-like text or speech. They have a broad understanding of language, but might not fully grasp the smaller nuances. They're often meant for contact generation more than, uh, rather than for specialized analysis or special, specialized tasks. And so you've probably likely interacted with some of these NLPs in your daily life without realizing it. The NL, the voice assistants, Amazon's Alexa, Apple Siri, predictive text, if you've seen predictive text in email applications, chat GPT, chat box, chat bots on different customer service websites, all of these technologies employ natural language processing to understand and respond to human language. While incredibly useful, they're not without their limitations and can sometimes produce errors, highlighting the ongoing development in NLP technology. Remember that NLP and AI are rapidly evolving fields. The technologies that we're discussing today are really just the tip of the iceberg. They're continuously, um, continuously improving and expanding in capabilities. By understanding the basics of AI, machine learning, and natural language processing, you can better appreciate the technological advancements that are becoming an integral part of our everyday lives. So now that we've talked about NLP in general, um, we also want to look at, we now want to turn our focus to looking at how, how NLP can work in clinical settings. 
So we know NLP works on text, and this means it can work on clinical texts. So think of um, examples for, such as doctor's notes, electronic health records, patient medical histories, uh, and other qualitative text data. Natural language processing can be used to analyze, um, or as in, as in the example we're highlighting today, to de-identify data, this, this kind of data. The processing power of NLP programs means these tasks and actions can be run on large quantities of data and large data sets. NLPs can be trained to find personally identifying information, or PII, or private health information, PHI. But there are many different types of identifiers. HIPAA, which is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, has 18 such identifiers that it considers PII. And the ones that are listed on this slide are just a few of them. But these can also be broken up into direct and indirect identifiers. Direct identifiers are unique to a specific person. So think here, the name, a name, an email address, phone number, social security number. If you find a person's social security number, their account number, their full name, you can find that exact person. Biometrics, which is another, is another rapidly growing field, much of that data is also is considered a direct identifier because it is unique to an individual person. On the other hand, indirect identifiers, you typically need multiple pieces of information to identify a specific person. So for example, we had a person's age and their zip code, um, or if their ethnicity and their occupation, we could put those pieces of information together to ID someone but you would need multiple pieces of information to do so. An article by Nergit et al. points out that the removal of PHI from clinical notes is challenging because the potential number of words that could be PHI are limitless. De-identification is a complex task, and while there are rules to languages, the possibilities of how those how words are combined Possibilities are infinite. So these tools can help remove PHI, but they are not infallible, as we will talk about. So why does this matter? Why does data need to be de-identified? Um, sharing data advances research. It aids in reproducibility and helps determine best practices. Reproducibility is critical for advancing science. In a 2021 article, researchers were unable to attain data for 131 out of 193 cancer biology experiments. And the data in these experiments might not have been shared for a number of reasons, but, but de-identifying data can definitely be one of the barriers to sharing data. Tools that can automate or speed up the de-identification process can make data sharing much more feasible. It's also important to protect patient privacy, patient privacy, and sharing data, while it can benefit science and research, it should not be at the expense of participants' um, private information. So before you do an analysis, you may want to, you may want to de-identify your data to protect the privacy of participants and add a layer of security to your data. As more and more funders are mandating that researchers share their data whenever possible, data will need to be de-identified before that can safely happen. And now um, we want to take a, a pause here and we have a quick knowledge check. So feel free to drop your answers in the chat. What is natural language processing? A, Terminator T800. B, a computer coding language. C, a random text generator. D, an AI that allows computers to understand and mimic human language. And then I can pause for... Pause to allow you to drop your answers in the chat. Oops, sorry. 
All right, I see D. D. Yes, I see lots of Ds. Um, and that is correct. Yes, if you answer D, that is correct. Natural language processing includes a number of tasks, such as understanding human language and producing or generating human language. Um, depending on the type of NLP, it may be used to understand, uh, maybe used to understand a language or generate words. Um, and, you know, as we mentioned before, the LLMs, like ChatGPT, are also a type of NLP that focus on the, the generating of human language. So there are many different specialties and uses for NLP. Okay, and now I want, I want to pause here as well and see if we have any questions. And Katie, I don't know if you're able to look at the chat too. I don't see anything just yet. Um, but as we go along, feel free to to go ahead and, and share. Um, uh, go ahead, and you can always put, drop your questions into the chat. Yes, we'll take. We'll have at least another one or two times where we'll stop for questions, and we'll also hopefully have time for questions at the end. So, all right, I'm going to stop then. Or, yep, there you go. And you can see the correct screen, right? Yes, now we do. Okay. It's full screen. Yep. Perfect. All right. So um, now we're going to move on to talking a little bit about the different tools that are available to help with de-identification. Um, so the main tool that we're going to talk about today is NLM Scrubber. Um, and this was developed by the National Library of Medicine. Um, it's an NLP, and natural language processor, that's designed to identify PII, such as the ones that Christine was just talking about. So things like name, location, ages, social security numbers. Um, it finds that information, redacts it, and then replaces it with generic terms. Um, so Scrubber can be used to make clinical text data HIPAA compliant, but it's meant to be used on text files only. So it doesn't work on things like images, CSVs, uh, or Excel files. But we will talk about some tools that work on, uh, that do work on those file types. Uh, but overall, Scrubber just works on clinical text data. Hey, Katie. Katie. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of requests. If you could be closer to the microphone, uh, a little harder, a little hard to hear. Okay. Can you hear me a little bit better now? Maybe. Folks, you may also want to try and adjust <laughs> the volume on your computer if that helps as well. Can you hear me better? I guess it might be on my end. Does that help at all? No, it's that was worse. <laughs> way worse. Sorry. And now we don't hear. Does that anything. work at all? Oh, now we hear you. Now is this okay? I think it might be better. Let, let's just keep going and find see what happens. Okay. Okay. I apologize. Sorry. Sometimes my. I changed to a new computer and my settings are getting a little wonky sometimes and it doesn't always pick up my, my microphone for some reason. Okay. Um, okay. So, so the way that the scrubber is set up, it prioritizes privacy and being HIPAA compliant over keeping data. So it's going to redact a little bit more information in order to comply with this. Uh, scrubber is designed to remove what HIPAA deems PII. So other contextual information can still be used to identify people. And so it's really important that researchers still review the data to ensure that it is truly de-identified. Um, so you know, Christine talked some about those indirect identifiers. Um, Scrubber does look for those, but you can still sometimes piece together who a person is um, based on just the, the larger context of the clinical, clinical data. An NLM scrubber has been trained on things like medical histories, physicals, radiology, and pathology reports. So those types of clinical texts is what it's going to work best on. And this is an example of a, a patient file of some clinical notes. Um, and I apologize, I know this is a lot to, to kind of read over. Um, but in this example, the patient, John, he's having trouble sleeping due to his snoring. Um, so real quick, if you want to look through this, um, just try and skim through it. Um, but is there any PII that stands out to you with this? And you feel free to kind of drop your answers in the chat as well. All 
Um, and then somebody asked while you're, while you're looking at that for, for some of the PII in this example, someone asked, does the scrubber use redaction to de-identify? What about other techniques for um, obfuscating? Uh, so yeah, scrubber just redacts, um, and I'll show you an example of what that will look like here in just a second, um, but it doesn't do the blurring, I think is what it's called. Um, it doesn't, it's not able to do the blurring of information. And yeah, people are saying that they see some addresses on this example, there's names, um, the age of some of the relations, uh, full report name, looks like an account number and a patient ID number. And yes, there's, there's a lot of PII in this. And so what the scrubber is going to look for is um, all this information in blue. This is everything that the scrubber should, uh, should look for and hopefully de-identify. So once it's gone through the scrubber, this is what it'll look like. So you can see now that the name like John and Jill, those have been redacted with just personal name. And those uh, numbers that we saw for like patient ID numbers um, or report numbers, those have been changed to alphanumeric ID. Uh, the dates have also been changed. And um, something that the scrubber does is uh, whenever it runs up into like the, the report numbers or the study protocol numbers um, or even a social number, Instead of saying this is a social security number or this is a phone number um, or this is a patient ID number, it'll just get, change it over to that generic alphanumeric ID. So you still don't even know what kind of alphanumeric ID that it was um, that was there. Um, that's it's fully redacted. Um, another thing that people that I like to point out is you'll notice that only a couple of the ages um, got removed. Um, so it has mother personal name is ninety plus. Um, but died at age 84, or that this is a 65-year-old man, those ages aren't removed. Um, and that's because HIPAA only considers ages over 90 um, to be personally identifying information. So it's not going to uh, tag any of those ages below 90, because that's not what HIPAA considers um, private, uh, private information. And so somebody mentioned it looks like the strength is with free text fields. Yes, um, Scrubber does well with, like I said, it was trained on like pathology reports and um, discharge reports. So kind of more of those narrative-based things, um, that's what it's been trained on. So that's what it's going to, to work best on. Um, and so before I hop into the actual demo, um, you are able to download the Scrubber and the example files um, at the, the link shown here. And Scrubber is, uh, you're able to, to, to download this um, and you'll download the actual uh, graphic user interface. Um, when you download the Scrubber, it's not making any big changes to your computer or anything like that. Um, so it is pretty easy to download um, and run on your computer. And somebody asked, can Scrubber be used when needed to link scrubbed records? Don, I'm not sure what you you mean. Can you rephrase the, the question? I'll give him, him a minute to, I'm not sure. I can always come back to that question too, but um, I'm gonna go ahead and move into our demonstration of the scrubber. So I'm going to share my whole desktop here and, oh, actually. And bear with me, I have to move all my stuff around real quick. Um, so this is, this is my desktop and this is where I have the scrubber saved. And so it's just in here over in the very corner over here. This is where I have the scrubber. Um, it's saved onto my desktop so it's a little bit easier to access. And I'm gonna click on this to open it. And um, so the GUI, the GUI right here, this is the graphical user interface. And this is what we'll use to open the scrubber. I also have my example files here and I have my inputs. Um, inputs, And that's where I right now, I have this example EHR discharge for Isabel Garcia. 
Um, and so it looks like the mission date was May 20th of 2024. And um, this is a fake um, EHR. I used Gemini to uh, create this, this discharge report. I asked it to create a fake um, electronic health record so that way we can practice de-identifying for it. And if anybody's interested in the exact prompt that I used, I'm happy to, to share that. Um, but I did use Gemini to, to kind of generate this information real quick. Um, but as we look at this, um, this is just an example of what a discharge summary might look like. So, you know, we have the name here. Um, we have this um, numeric ID. We have some date um, and some other information on here. Um, you know, we have the physician listed down here, Dr. Sarah Thompson. Um, so all this information is, some, is things that would need to be redacted um, in order to make this um, HIPAA compliant and more safe to share with people. So I just wanted to kind of show you what this looks like before we go through and redact it. Um, please note that you do have to make sure that you remove any special characters. So there's no bullet points on here. Um, there's no lines or page breaks. Um, this is just a plain text file. Um, so if you have some of those special characters in there, um, Scrubber will, it, it'll cause Scrubber to fail. It won't be able to go through and redact any of the information. And minimize that. Okay, and so like I said, I have Scrubber um, here on my desktop and this is what it looks like whenever we, we open it. And I'm gonna click on where it says Scrubber.19.0411. We'll click on this. And this will open the actual Scrubber interface. Okay, um, and so this is what the Scrubber interface looks like. And so the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna click on Edit Configuration File. And this opens up a new little window. So here we have the input directory, output directory. And what the Scrubber does is we have to tell it what file folder we want, to, we want it to actually scrub. So that's gonna be our input. So we're gonna hit Browse. And like I said, I have this on my desktop. I have a, a whole folder just for Scrubber. I have my example files, and then I have my dummy input. And that's where the uh, record for Isabel Garcia is. So I'm gonna hit okay, because that's the file that I want Scrubber to actually scrub. And another benefit of, the, of using the Scrubber is it protects that version control. You have to have your output in a separate folder. So that original, unaltered, unedited um, file will, will remain. Um, that'll stay in its own folder. It'll remain untouched. And once it goes through the scrubber, you'll get a whole new file um, that's been scrubbed. So it maintains that version control. You'll get a brand new file once it's been scrubbed. So now I need to tell scrubber where I want it to put that new file. So I'm going to hit Browse again, um, go back under Examples, and I have my dummy output. Okay, so now I've told it what files I want it to scrub. I've told it where I want it to put the new files. Um, this option here, Input Files Filter, you are able to configure Scrubber um, a little bit. So let's say, for example, you wanted to keep um, certain pieces of information, like maybe you want to keep more of the dates or more of the, the locations or something like that. You can go in and configure Scrubber um, in order to keep those pieces of information. Just keep in mind that if you are keeping that information, it's no longer considered HIPAA compliant. And you're also able to just use Scrubber as is, um, like it is out of the box. You don't have to change any of the configurations on it. Um, so that's what we're going to do today. We're not going to try and mess with any of the configurations. We're just going to run it as is. So I'm going to hit OK. And now the box in the middle, the de-identify data, um, it's ready to de-identify that file. You can do multiple files at once. Um, for this example, we're just doing the one file. Uh, so I'll go ahead and click on that. And the more files that you're doing, it, it does take a little bit longer to go through, but we're just doing the one file today. Um, so we'll just kind of wait here for a second as it does its thing. And I'm going to check the, the chat. OK, so. Okay, so Don said, sometimes the information is in more than one record. Is there any way of linking before or after Scrubber, i.e. when an individual's information is across multiple records? Um, so we'll get into this a little bit more as we go along, but a really important part of this with de-identifying is ultimately it's the researcher's responsibility 
to go through and you know do dil do dil do their due diligence to make sure that any personally identifying information has been scrubbed or it's been blurred in some way. Um, so I don't want to say like a hard no um, or a hard yes, um, but if you are, Scrubber only works on clinical text data. There's other tools that might work on things like the, the x-ray images or on um, structured data like, uh, like CSVs or Excel files. And so you need to use different tools for different data types in order to scrub that across different different things. Um, you still have the risk of, like I said, those indirect identifiers or kind of the context around what they might be going into a particular visit for. And um, you might still be able to kind of piece together who a person is um, just for those other context information. Um, so that is something that researchers do need to consider and see if using multiple techniques um, for, for blurring and for anonymizing data um, to, to try and make sure that you're, you're protecting that patient, patient privacy as much as possible. Okay, so um, while we waited, um, it Scrubber finished, and now we see that the open output button, that's bolded. Um, so it's ready for us to look at that new folder, uh, that new file. So I'm going to click on open output. And like I said, it created a whole new file. Um, so now we have ehrdischarge.nphi. So I'm going to open this. Let me zoom in a little bit here. And so now you can see that all this information has, has been redacted. So um, we don't see the name anymore. Um, the dates have been replaced with those generic brackets of just, of just date. Um, personal names have been removed. Um, the doctor's names have been removed. Um, so now this is, um, it looks like this would be, be HIPAA compliant because that personal identifying information has been, has been removed out of Scrubber. And so that's just an example of kind of how Scrubber works. This is a you know, small one record that it did it, uh, did it on, but you can use this on multiple records at once. You don't have to go through this um, one by one. All right, I'm gonna go back to, let me click out of this. I'm gonna go back to our slides. Um, and I'm going to pause here real quick and see does anybody have any questions about the, the Scrubber demo before I go on. I'm happy to go back and touch base on anything if anybody had any questions about that. All right. So... Um, so we'll talk about some of the pros of using the Scrubber. Um, so one of the benefits of using the Scrubber is that it's very secure. The code for the Scrubber is not openly shared. And um, so this is a free resource. Anybody can use it, but it's not technically an open source resource um, because they haven't shared that code. Um, and but this does make it harder for people to use that code and then sort of reverse engineer um, ways to re-identify data. So um, that code's not openly shared and that makes it, helps make it a little bit more secure. The scrubber is also run locally. Um, it's on, run on your computer. It's not connected to the internet in any way. Once you've downloaded that graphical user interface that we just looked at, um, that's on your computer only. It's not connected to the internet at all. So um, this is just another way that it helps um, ensure that that data privacy is not connected to the cloud. So um, you, you won't get potentially have that, that, that back door into it. It's run only on your computer. The Scrubber is also pretty fast. Um, in an article by Hyder, they compared the Scrubber to ClinyDID and Amazon's version of a, of a de-identifier. Um, and Scrubber was a little bit faster than those two other tools. So um, that's the benefit of it. Um, I mentioned this before, but Scrubber is uh, pretty usable, um, especially with many hospitals and medical organizations um, really cracking down on what you're able to access and um, like, you know, putting firewalls up to different sites. The Scrubber is just a zip file um, with an interface, and you can also get a couple test files that you can run and practice with. 
um, but it's not actually making any major changes to your computer or anything. Uh, so it's a little bit easier to download, to use, and, and actually get a hold of than, than some of the other tools. Um, the scrubber also has some tailoring options. So like I said, you can uh, you can opt to keep certain terms or phrases um, if you want to keep those from being redacted. Um, but this does uh, prevent it from being HIPAA compliant, but you can keep that information depending on what your what research someone is doing. Um, the scrubber can be configured to allow for that. And the scrubber also broadly redacts anything that I think it thinks might be PII. So when it's weighing the balance between keeping details or protecting privacy, the scrubber is going to lean more towards protecting privacy. Um, and it follows the safe harbor principles and makes data HIPAA compliant. Um, but there are some caveats to this. Um, Don's question kind of touched on this, but I'll, I'll go into a little bit more detail about it. Um, so the scrubber or really any other de-identification tool, um, it's not beyond reproach. It's not going to be 100% effective 100% of the time. Um, so despite efforts to make it HIPAA compliant, um, there is always some sort of risk of re-identification. Um, so there needs to be a human element to this process. Um, ultimately, it's the researcher's or PI's responsibility to evaluate if the NLM scrubber is best suited for their particular needs, um, and then to check that that data has been fully de-identified. Uh, so I mentioned earlier that those indirect identifiers like zip codes, occupation, race, place of birth, um, those can still be used to piece together who someone is. Um, so there may still be information in the data that can be used to identify someone, even if it's considered HIPAA compliant. So um, HIPAA compliant and fully de-identified, uh, those terms are not interchangeable. Um, the Scrubber also the website also suggests using a data use agreement when you archive it. Um, in, when you archive it, limit the access as an additional measure of protection. And we'll talk a little bit more about data use agreements too as we go along, have an example of those. Um, so some other considerations with the Scrubber is that there's um, a Windows and a Linux version, but the Scrubber can't actually be used on a Mac. Um, so there's that, that drawback to it. Um, some articles noted that there was issues with the character alignment of, of an Inalan Scrubber. Um, if I have any fellow d and nerds out there, I'm not talking about your character, your fun kind of character alignments. Um, with the scrubber, the original alignment isn't maintained after it's been scrubbed. So if you notice, we took the name John, um, and then we changed it to personal name. Um, so personal name has a lot more characters than John does. Um, so that alignment isn't maintained throughout the, the text once it's been scrubbed. Um, another study noted that scrubber didn't reliably catch age, um, but scrubber only looks for ages over 90, since that's what HIPAA considers PII. Um, another noted that the identifiers often have trouble with names. Um, so there are over 16,000 names in the census that are either medical terms or common words. So, you know, things like April or Dallas, um, those names might get incorrectly noted as, as a date or as an address. Um, so names can be, can be very tricky to, to de-identify. Um, but again, that's kind of where that human element comes in to, to make sure that the information truly has been de-identified. So I want to look at a couple real-life examples, and this first one is from University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, and they created this massive research data warehouse, um, and they're a network of over 40 hospitals with over 8,000 beds, um, so that's a lot of medical records that they're dealing with, but they use the NLN scrubber to do what they call the best effort de-identification, um, and this allowed them to participate with national data work networks, um, including all of us. Um, and so the de-identification was a crucial step before they were able to share that data back out to researchers and other organizations. Um, so this might be a good article to look at for how they um, de-identified across different types of files. They might have some good information in there for this. Um, but in this case, the University of Pittsburgh did, um, a, like I said, a best effort de-identification. Um, so they had a lot of information to go through, and they needed a very solid, efficient workflow process. Um, they also have a data use agreement about how the data can be shared, um, how people have to handle their data, um, and um, what can happen to it um, after the, the research project. Um, so that's one example that I wanted to show you. 
Um, the other example I wanted to talk about is a little bit, it's kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum. Um, this was a much more intense de-identification process. Um, so I highly recommend if you're interested in this topic, um, going back and watching Dr. Rebecca Campbell's webinar. Um, she, she talked a lot more about their, their de-identification process that they went through. Um, she dealt with some very highly, highly sensitive information, um, and her webinar dives into the trade-off between protecting patient, protecting the privacy of people, um, and keeping that usability of the information, um, and how they made some of those calls when they were going through their data. Um, so they didn't use Scrubber on this particular project, uh, but this is a very extreme version of how they de-identified information, um, and how they, they developed those processes and procedures for dealing with that. Again, researchers really need to think about what sort of processes and tools are going to best suit their research project, um, what information they're looking for, and what they kind of hope to, to have come about with it. And the links for, for uh, the webinars and the article that went along with it, um, those are all in the, the slides too. Okay, so there's a couple other tools out there um, that I want to touch briefly on. Um, Scrubber is definitely not the only de-identifier tool out there. Um, so Clinicuity, this also de-identifies data based on HIPAA standards. Um, and it accurately finds identifiers and tags and replaces them with realistic surrogates, so very similar to what the Scrubber does. Um, it does require Java to run, but it works on both Macs and uh, Windows computers. And Clinicuity has multiple input and output options. And so this will work on both structured and unstructured data. So it'll work on things like SQL databases, um, CSVs, and you can download it off of GitHub and uh, they also have some help documentation on their GitHub page as well. So the next one is ARX. Um, and again, this is a Java user interface. An ARX can be used to re-identify, uh, to assess re-identification and privacy risk. It has several different models to choose from. And this tool, again, can be used on Excel and CSV files. And if you need something that works on structured data, this tool is probably a helpful one to look at. Um, there's a website with more documentation, and the tool is available through GitHub. One of the things I like about this tool is, like I said, is it has um, not only does it have models for de-identifying data, but it also has models for assessing the risk of um, if something could be re-identified or not. So it has several different models to choose from that you can look at. Um, the next one is going to be Open NLP, and uh, the this one isn't designed specifically for de-identification. Um, it has a broad range of NLP tasks. And um, so it has one that's called, one of the tools that it has is called entity extraction. So it can be used to extract certain pieces of information. So like PII, you can train it to extract those, those pieces of information. Um, Open NLP has a pretty extensive online community, including mailing lists, help documentation. There's even a Slack channel um, that you can connect to more experienced users. Um, but this one's much more broad for all sorts of uh, natural language processing tasks. And then lastly, um, we have the DICOM library. And this is a free online tool that can anonymize medical images for educational and scientific purposes. And this tool was funded by the EU. Um, but keep in mind with medical images that biometric data is considered PII. The images may be trickier to truly de-identify. Um, things like skull shape, unique size, shape, or location of a tumor, a scar, or a tattoo, um, those all might be enough to re-identify someone. Um, so extra precautions may need to be taken to protect privacy or limit access um, when dealing with things like images. And there's even more tools. Um, as you can see, there's uh, many different tools. That can, uh, that can help with the identification. Um, some are written in R, some are in Python. Um, all of these are freely available um, and the links to all these will be in the slide. And de-identification isn't without challenges. Whatever tool researchers decide to go with, all of them need some sort of human oversight and accountability. Um, as with any other AI, the quality of the data you put in is going to be the quality of the data that you get out. Uh, so garbage in, garbage out. 
Uh, researchers should really be vigilant in handling data and protecting privacy. Data use agreements are also part of this, um, informing people of how their data might be used um, and the risk of re-identification. Um, so for data use agreements, um, this is a legal contract that governs data sharing between two entities. So um, this might be between researchers or researchers in a hospital or researchers in a medical organization um, or between two medical organizations. But data use agreements establish how the data might be used um, by the recipient um, and how that data should be protected. So common limitations can include things like non-commercial purposes only, um, it might require researchers to apply for access and explain what they would use the data for. Um, it can prohibit sharing the data with any third party um, or other limitations just intended to protect the data. Oklahoma State University has a really great data use agreement toolkit. Um, and this goes through the ins and outs of such agreements. Um, Harvard Data First and NIH both have sample agreements that can be used as reference as well. And so those are some resources that you can use to kind of um, better understand data, data use agreements and what they might cover. And then looking towards the future, um, standardization is going to continue being a challenge. Um, different hospitals, different systems, different doctors, they all take different kinds of notes. Um, different AI tools have been trained on different data sets. Um, Nanol and Scrubber has been trained on things like medical histories, radiology and pathology reports. Uh, these are going to look very different from things like psychiatry notes or nursing notes, um, even if they're from the same hospital system. Um, so really the solution to this is more data. Um, we need more models, more exposure to all these different types of qualitative data um, so that the tools can be improved, we can create new tools. Um, the more these tools are used, the more developed they, we can make them, the better they can get at de-identifying data um, and the other tasks that we need them for. I'm going to check the chat and see if I have any other questions. Okay, so I said, uh, find your comment that data, people should be informed about how their data will be used since the advent of EHRs. I've never had a doctor's employee explain to me or ask me if my data could be used or shared. Um, I know, in my personal experience, this just might be the, the hospital system that I tend to, to frequent or go to. Um, I know in like my intake paperwork, I have to sign off on um, who is allowed to like see my, my data, like on the, in the terms and conditions for saying, you know, this is going to be shared across like system wide, um, but that might be very, very depending on what your state laws are, what your local laws are and stuff. But um, I, that it, I think that is an important part of it too, is we, and across any kind of data, we should know what people are, what, data we what data is actually being shared um and why i think that's important for everybody to know like across the board um, whether companies actually follow that or not is a different thing but that's that's another webinar <laughs> okay so we have one little quick knowledge check um for you before i hand it back over to christine um but what does the nlm scrubber do uh, does it prevent data from ever being re-identified ever again um, does it crawl the web looking for the best cat pictures? Um, does it securely share and process data on the cloud? Um, or does it remove PII from any file type or E, none of the above? Um, and again, feel free to drop your answers into the chat. Okay. Awesome, I'm seeing a couple of people answer E. And that is correct. Um, so just kind of as a recap, um, de-identification tools are, aren't foolproof. Um, they're, they require human oversight. And tools, including NLM scrubbers, they're not going to catch everything every time. Um, but uh, the scrubber can remove many pieces of PII and, and mitigate that risk of re-identification. Um, so uh, the NLM scrubber is an NLP. It's not a web crawler. It's not connected online. Um, files are not shared or stored on the cloud. Scrubber runs on your computer, so uh, making it a little bit more secure. And the Scrubber is for clinical text or unstructured data like clinical notes. Um, it's not meant to de-identify medical forms or patient chart files or, or images. 
All right. Um, and then again, if anybody has any questions, um, please feel free to, to drop those in the chat. I'm going to hand it back over to Christine, but let me know if you have any questions about the scrubber or any of the other tools that we, we talked about. All right. Thanks, Katie. Yeah, now we want to talk about how to promote and use these tools at your library. So um, one place to start is by learning more about coding and programming, um, such as through the Carpentries. Um, the Carpentries are designed as an introduction for beginners. Um, all of their lessons are openly licensed and free to use. They have ones on um, they have lessons on Unix and learning to use the shell, um, which help may, which may help familiarize you with the command prompt and terminal interfaces. That if you wanted to do more of that customization, um, with uh, or um, of changing what. Uh, changing what the Kerber does by default. And there are uh, many ways to incorporate the NLM Scrubber and these other tools in your library instruction. So if you're talking with faculty and students about open data, open science, why not mention that the NLM Scrubber is openly available um, for producing reusable and shareable data? Uh, data de-identification demonstrates, it's, it certainly demonstrates a challenge for producing fair data, but if we're um, but using tools like this, such as these, can lead to, can also lead to more reusable and accessible data. You could host a workshop on NLM Scrubber or on data de-identification in general. And another way to incorporate these tools um, is, to, uh, is to, to kind of look at them as examples of AI-fueled technology that augments human tasks. As we said before, like we're not replacing human oversight, but there are new tools that are emerging that can be used to accomplish new tasks or improve workflows, and they can be used alongside traditional research methods. The NLM scrubber and um, data de-identification, these also intersects, intersect with other research topics, so we can think about including these tools and things that you're already offering. For example, if you're um, we're talking about data management and the life cycle, the research data life cycle. Data de-identification really does fit in um, into that cleaning or processing phase of data management. If you're promoting an institutional repository, you could think about the NLM scrubber, talking about how it can prepare data to be archived in a repository. Uh, when we talk about protecting data privacy, uh, it's especially important in health science related fields. So talking about and having conversations around data de-identification, what is PHI and PII, what are the different direct and indirect identifiers is a great way to start the conversation around data privacy and what are the ethics and responsibilities of researchers to protecting patient privacy. You could also think about adding these tools to a libguide. We've linked a couple of examples. One is on data identification tools and another on data management resources. And another uh, area for outreach or education around these tools might be talking about how they can be used by, by researchers with NIH funding. The NIH, da NIH data management and sharing policy requires a plan for how data will be managed and shared. The related tools section, which is one of the required elements, is where um, you're asked to specify tools and software. And the NLM Scrubber being a freely available tool, um, as but many of these other ones are, means that future researchers could more easily repeat or replicate um, a research plan's methods. The plan also asks about access, distribution, and reuse considerations. And it was a great thing that someone brought up in the chat about um, the importance particularly of protecting human subjects research participants, that the NLM scrubber and tools, um, these other de-identification tools, they can be used to prepare human subjects research data for sharing. But what tools, um, any tools that are being used to protect privacy, they should also be mentioned in any consent forms and also in the data management plan. So people should be informed if their data is going to be shared and what tools are going to be used to make their data shareable. And there's so many data-themed weeks now that it's hard to keep track, but just to highlight that coming up in January, there will be um, Data Privacy Week from the National Cybersecurity Alliance. There's also iHeart Methods Week, which was new in 2024. 
Um, we talked about data, data identification part of the methods process. And a lot of these weeks now will have their own, might already have promotional toolkits, um, so you're not having to start from scratch. And we really want uh, to emphasize, I guess, that this isn't meant to be a big lift, that you might already be doing programming around data or open science at your institution. And the tools we've been talking about today are just more tools you can add to your tool belt, tool belt and point your researchers to. Talking points around the NLM scrubber, and these are in your handout as well, but I'll just highlight that the scrubber is openly available. Um, it has no, it's free, there's no subscription, it's going to remain freely available. Um, for researchers or clinicians, you can emphasize that the scrubber can be used to make data, data HIPAA compliant, and that um, sharing data and engaging in good data practices increases the impact of their research. For graduate students, PhD, PhDs, um, really any of your users, um, especially those maybe not as familiar with AI or natural language processing, you can. Um, these are some tools that you can kind of explore. The one that's a great thing about the NLM scrubber, which Katie mentioned, is that it is um, what's called a closed system, so that the data you're putting into um, putting into the scrubber is never leaving your computer. It remains secure, and it's not being used to train future AI, future programs. Um, and again, while these are, um, while there are all these technologies to identify and remove potentially sensitive information, it's important that humans remain involved in ensuring that data privacy is protected. We have just a quick thank yous to Dr. Ramet K. Elp, who actually is, uh, was in charge of creating the NLM Scrubber. He answered many of our questions, and his team is actually currently working on a new version. So they have, um, there's two links here on the slide for if you have any issues with the scrubber or if you'd like to share any feedback of features either that you or your researchers would like to see, would like to keep, would like to add. Um, we'll hopefully have more to share as the uh, future plans go along. And then also a thank you to Nikitha Maripaka, who is an LAS student at the University of North Texas. She helped with creating this workshop, this work webinar as part of an internship program with NNLM Region 3. And then we have resources, which are also in your handout. We have references, also in the handout. And finally, um, our contact information for myself and Katie. Uh, we thank you for joining us and... Thanks for watching. This video was produced by the Network of the National Library of Medicine. Select the circular channel icon to subscribe to our channel or select a video thumbnail to watch another video from the channel.